Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. What was Paul's thorn in the flesh? Well, the truth is nobody knows. because And, and I, I think it, we were not meant to know, so I'm going to begin on that basis, uh, try to think outside the box, try to explain why we needed to uh, know something that God elected uh, not to tell us much about. There are a few things that I want to emphasize right up front. Uh, one is if God chooses to remain silent about something, anything, I, th I think that there's a purpose in that. And if He chose to remain silent about it, I don't want to sp really spend my time riding down that dead-end trail, but uh, try to zero in on the message that the Holy Spirit intended to convey. I think a lot of people have spent a lot of time for nothing. Now, it is true, God didn't tell us when the rapture would occur, but that subject deals with eschatology, whereas Paul's thorn in the flesh deals with our life, our walk, our relationship with Him, our walk as Christians, which is far, far different. I think it falls into the category of doctrine. Now, Paul speaks of a thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He calls it a messenger of Satan don't skip over the word message, okay? He was tormented by it. Many explanations have been put forward. But whether Paul is referring to a physical, spiritual, or emotional uh, affliction or something else entirely has never been really answered by anybody with any satisfaction. I think that the one thing that we can say for sure is he was not talking of a literal thorn. He must have been speaking metaphorically. I think that, that we, we should look at it as him speaking biblically. Some of the more popular theories of the thorns interpretation include uh, temptation, a chronic eye problem, malaria, migraines, epilepsy, uh, speech uh, disability. Some even say that the thorn refers to a person such as Alexander the coppersmith who, who did Paul a great deal of harm. As we read in 2 Timothy, but no one can say for sure what Paul's thorn in the flesh was, but it was a source of some, of some kind of real pain in his life. So in looking at the context, and I, I think that's where we ought to begin, uh, in the 12th chapter we're dealing with visions and revelations. I'm going to suggest to you that there were those who were burdening the believers at Corinth that they were laying claim to special visions or special revelation, and that they were using those in, in the course of their ministry there at Corinth. In the fourth verse, he was caught up into paradise, and he heard unspeakable words which it's not lawful for a man to utter. The text clearly says that what he heard, he understood, but he was not allowed to speak. He couldn't come back and, and tell folks what he heard. I've stated on numerous occasions when the Word of God was complete, when we had the official, the, the canon complete, God had no longer any use for visions and revelations, and they're totally inseparable or, or totally separated from any process of ours. Today, as believers in Christ, you and I have been called by grace to trust Him. And we trust Him because we have a complete revelation in His Word. And when we're interested in whatever God might have to say to us, it's in His Word. It's no longer by visions and revelation. It is inter interesting uh, that Paul was over and over again delivered from danger and from bondage. In the Philippian jail, the chains fell off, the doors flew open. He could have walked out a free man as he sat there singing praises to God. But in later life, he was imprisoned and put to death in Rome. No doors were open, no chains fell off. 
Why? Why was that? Because the Holy Spirit, through Paul, had penned the last word of the revelation of God. And no longer is there any need for visions and revelations. We have a complete revelation. The problem is, is we ignore that and look for experiences and revelations and whatever outside His Word. We have everything God intended. And when the Word of God was complete, those kind of apparent miracles, I don't know whether one wants to define them as miracles or not, they ceased. There's no need for what he heard to be said for what Paul was doing by the leading of the Holy Spirit, what he was doing, not, not Paul's intelligence, not his mind, not his, his brilliance, nor his theology, but his pen. The Holy Spirit carried him along directing him on what he should say. One commentator states that, you know, well, I doubt that Paul understood quite everything that he wrote. Oh, come on. I doubt that he understood much of anything that he wrote. We're not here to deify Paul or to bring great glory to his name. He was a tool used by the sovereign God to complete the revelation of God. And these kinds of visions and revelations are unnecessary. What Paul heard in paradise, he was not permitted to speak. He couldn't come back and tell about it. Now, if Paul couldn't, you know, one has to wonder how others could. It seems apparent to me from the text that there were those in Corinth that were doing that same thing. I'm certain that there are those today doing that. They've received special visions, uh, special commissions, special something from God. You know, and if, if you could just get a slight glimpse of the, the burden that they have or that they've received, then you'd, you would just join wholeheartedly in the work or something like that. Folks, if Paul is not allowed to say it, how can anybody else say it? If you've had such a, a vision in Revelation, surely the argument still is in effect that you also were not permitted to speak about it. That God is not going to tell you anything that you can come back and tell. You know, where most of the 8 billion people on the planet never heard about it except for those in your tiny little circle. Verse 5, Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Verse 6, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. I wouldn't boast. The only boast that I would make is in my weakness. For if I should desire to boast, that's, that's a third class condition, I don't want to be foolish, for I speak the truth and I'll endure, lest any man should think of me more than he ought to think, more than what he sees me or hears me to be. In other words, in the true minister of Christ, there's no push to make himself something that he really isn't. Not something to push himself ahead of the Lord or in any way present himself to be something that he really isn't. Lest that should happen, because of the abundance of the revelations that Paul had had, I get the impression, and though I only do that because of the word that's used there, that probably no other human had had any more revelations than Paul, not Moses, not David, not Isaiah, not Jeremiah, but Paul. However, there's, there's surely a mark in this verse of the jealousy of our God. Not, not jealousy in the way in which we tend to use the word, because there is no sin with God. But God guards His glory. It wasn't the process nor the intent of the Holy Spirit to bring glory to Paul. Paul. 
It was not God's intent to make Paul great, but to exalt Jesus Christ. When God first uh, spoke to Ananias in Damascus after Paul's Damascus experience, God said to Ananias, I'll show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. I want you to keep in mind Paul is a pattern to those who believe hereafter, thereafter. Now, that seems so contrary to human logic. We start out with a bunch of uh, presuppositions that God is great, God is mighty, God is powerful, God can, God can do anything He wants to do. If God wants me to be His messenger, you know, just you know, imagine how much that accrues to me, you know, and how much authority and power that I have. You know, if someone could uh, come in and say, you know, I'm speaking personally for the President of the United States, the office, he has the position that he has, the responsibility that he has, bears with it a certain amount of authority, yet in the case of the ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are nothing. Nothing. In fact, Paul points out that he's nothing in verse 11. Though I be nothing. Nothing. Okay? Now one of the most popular Bible teachers running around the country today is pointing out that a lot of Christians, well, a lot of Christians have gotten the idea that they're nothing and that's wrong. They need to see themselves as something. And folks, I'm not sure I agree entirely with that thesis. I believe it is the Lord Jesus Christ who is something. That's what I believe. It's possible that because of Paul's carnality and the weakness of his flesh, that with all of these, all of these revelations that he, that, that he received, he'd begin to boast of himself. You know, he'd push himself ahead of some other Christian. If you have had great revelation from God, it's not because you're better than others. It's because God is using you as a tool and you're nothing but a tool in the Master's hand. It's, it's not the terror of God that would give Paul a thorn in the flesh. It's not the anger of God that would give Paul a thorn in the flesh. It's not the judgment of God, but the love of God that would make sure that His lowly messenger Paul would not be exalted above measure and wouldn't lay boast and claim to some of these revelations which he had no right to do. God could just have easily chosen Peter for this position or John or, or somebody that you and I have never heard of. There's, there certainly was no constraint upon God to choose Paul. And yet, not only did God choose Paul, He separated him from his mother's womb, as we're looking at in Galatians on Sunday. And I believe every aspect in the process of Paul's education and training was directed by the sovereignty of Almighty God. That Paul was a tool shaped and planned and prepared by the Master from the time that he was born until he completed the last word of God's revelation. And God could have just as easily done that with someone else. There was no merit in Paul. No goodness in Paul. No greatness in Paul. Nothing in Paul. It was God and God alone who prepared him for the job that He had him to do. Now God's great love and concern for Paul shows forth I believe in the verse that lest Paul should get off track through the great abundance of the revelations that were given to him. And I read in that expression that Paul had received more revelation from God than anybody, any other human, with, well, with, maybe with, with the possible exception of Adam, more than Elijah, more than, more than Moses, Abraham, David, Jeremiah, Isaiah, or any any of the prophets or any of the apostles. And that was because Paul was such a great guy, right? No. But because Paul was used greatly. 
And I want it clearly understood that God could have used anybody else. Anybody. You know, the great humanist arguments today would argue that Paul was used because he was, he was willing to be used. Well, that's funny to me because I, was, <laughs> I kind of laugh at that. I mean, sure, sure, he was sure willing after God hit him with a bolt of lightning, struck him to his knees, took his eyesight away, led him into Damascus, made a, a coward out of him to sneak him over the wall in a basket. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd say, yeah. He... Paul's life is a testimony to the sovereignty of God. Not the willingness of Paul, and yet sermon after sermon after sermon preached to Christians today is somehow it, to set Paul up as an example so that you ought to be like Paul, that you ought to have the same willingness, the same zeal, the same desire to serve when what we ought to see, what we ought to see is the operation of God in the life. I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't be willing, that you shouldn't have a desire to serve, not, not in the least. I am suggesting that any approach to the Scriptures that takes glory from Christ and puts it on a man is wrong. And God in His great love gave Paul a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, underline the word messenger, okay, to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. Three times he said, God, please take it away. God said, the reason it's there is so that you might learn my grace is sufficient for you. And so I, you know, Paul quits asking, and he is now he now boasts in his weakness, not in his strength. I counted 51 thorns in the flesh that people ideas people came up with. You know, it seems to me, if nothing else, that should clearly indicate that we don't know what it was. So why should we care? God didn't reveal what it was. Or did He? Some believe it was another human. One guy said it was Barnabas. I, of course, know it was Paul himself. I, I just don't know how to explain that. that. That Satan's message was that self mattered, that Paul mattered, Now, I'm sorry, but I don't see where we gain any value at all spending any time trying to discuss what it was, whether it was physical weakness, whether it was external pressure, whether it was a, another individual, uh, you know, the means by which God used, you know. I don't know. What I do know is it was real to Paul. There are those who argue that obviously the Corinthians knew what this thorn in the flesh was. Well, they knew, you know, bad eyesight, poor speech, uh, you know, bow legs, uh, you know, short stature, couldn't see over the pulpit, well, you know, whatever. I get the impression the way this chapter began that the Corinthians didn't know what it was either. I don't think the Corinthians knew what it was. For 14 years, nobody had known that Paul was caught up into paradise and nobody knew what the thorn in the flesh was. You know, the human argument is that he was, well, he was stoned. When he was stoned, he died, and he was caught up into paradise, and then God resurrected him so that when he stood up, the disciples looked at him, and they said, you know, well, gee, you know, you're not dead. And, and he never mentioned what happened. But now they knew because he couldn't, he couldn't talk anymore. I've even alluded to you that it, it seems clear in the Scriptures that when Paul first appeared on the scene, you know, he, he spoke as, as Mercury, the god of oratory, and when he got to Corinth, you know, his speech was contemptible. Alright, and the Greek would, would indicate that he stuttered. And so one of the arguments is that, you know, one of those stones hit him in the throat or something, and his, his beautiful... Uh, oratorical ability was gone and so and he now stuttered and that was the thorn in his flesh i don't know that 
surely that's the kind of thing that would be pushed today, you know, promoted somehow or other, no matter, no matter how you word it. Dearly beloved, you're going to get some of the praise from people as a minister of the gospel. Paul had never mentioned it. I conclude from the text that the Corinthians never even knew that he had a thorn in the flesh, that he was buffeted daily by something, and they never knew it. He never spoke about it. His responsibility was the glory, the majesty, the power of Jesus Christ. And if there's to be any boast at all in what the Holy Spirit is forcing me to do in this text, I'll boast in my weaknesses. I sought the Lord. I asked Him to take it away. He said no. Most gladly, verse 9, most gladly, therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities, that is, in my weaknesses, in order that the power of the Christ might rest upon me. The weaker I am, the more Christ has to do. The better I am, the less Christ has to do. So if there's going to be any boast in this at all, it's going to be in my weakness. Therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses. Boy, is that contrary to much of what I hear today. Pastor Steve, I do not believe that God wants us to suffer. Well, you know, folks, if you start out with that presupposition, you're going to build a whole theology on it. I believe it is necessary for me to suffer if I'm ever going to know anything of the grace of God, the love of God, the power of God, the majesty of God. And I find that the inevitable result was not to argue with God nor to complain about the thorn in the flesh, whatever it might be, but rather to gladly glory or boast in my weaknesses in order that the power of Christ might rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses, in reproaches, he says, in necessities, in persecutions, in difficulties, in distresses for Christ's sake. I think these thorns in the flesh can cover a lot of areas for each one of us. For when I'm weak, then I'm made strong, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. God's goal in allowing the thorn in the flesh was to keep Paul humble. The, the text makes that crystal clear. No pride. I'm going to suggest that had any one of us encountered Jesus and was commissioned personally by Him, I think we would in our natural state become puffed up. Add to that the fact that Paul was moved by the Holy Spirit to write much of the New Testament. And it's easy to see how Paul could become exalted above measure or, or too proud. Now we can't compare ourselves with that. I understand that, but maybe we don't have to to have our own thorn in the flesh sent by God through a messenger of Satan. That's, that's when de that Satan puts wrong thoughts in your head. God is keeping us humble. Paul says that the affliction came from or by a messenger of Satan, just as God allowed Satan to torment Job. God allowed Satan to torment Paul for God's own good purpose. No one likes to live in pain. And I'm sure pain can and often does conflict with good and godly desires and goals and ambitions, you know, spiritual hopes, uh, service for the Lord. I mean, after all, that's why we were created, to serve God, to worship God. That's why we exist. That's why we're here. Paul sought the Lord three times to remove that source of pain from him. In verse 8, he probably had many good reasons why he should be pain-free. You know, he, he, pain-free, he could have had a more effective ministry. He could, he could run around all over the place. He could reach more people with the gospel. He could glorify God like never before, you know. But the Lord was more concerned with building Paul's character and preventing pride 
Instead of removing the problem, whatever it was, God gave Paul more overwhelming grace, just grace upon grace, and, and more compensating strength. Paul learned that God's power is made perfect in weakness. Verse 9. Paul talks about his own particular burden and the anguish which at times seems to sink him almost into utter despair. Sometimes our handicaps are excuses. Sometimes they're challenges. Sometimes they're blessings in disguise. And sometimes they're just totally inexplicable. Whatever they are, they need never be a curse in the life of the child of God. For it is true that all things work, whether you want to believe it or not, all things work together for good. That is all things work together for good to them that love God. Romans 8.28 If we can only have patience and trust in His love. After all, we did not choose Him. He chose us. I think we each one of us have a thorn in the flesh. I think the reason why God chose not to reveal Paul's thorn in the flesh is because it's different for all of us. It's not what it was that we ought to waste our time trying to figure out, which like so many others have done, and I, for the life of me, I can't, I can't figure out why so much time has been, been spent trying to figure out what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. It, that's, that, folks were riding down the wrong trail. I think that our, our focus, our interest, ought to be on not what Paul's was, but the whole reality of the, the whole concept of the thorn in the flesh, which was not limited to Paul. I think it's a universal element, a truth of the Christian life, we we all have, I mean we all have different experiences in life. We all have our trials, our troubles, our tribulations, our everything. Whether it's physical, whether it's mental, whether it's spiritual, they're different for each one of us. It's not what it is 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 not as that's not as important as why it is. I guess is what I'm trying to say so. Uh, so if you came here hoping to uh, you clicked on this video hoping for me to to hear me say what paul's thorn in the flesh was i'm sorry to disappoint you no idea <laughs> i mean i could offer suggestions too just the same as everyone else i i can tell you what i i think mine is my thorn in the flesh is I, no, it's not you. Uh, all right, that was a bad joke, but it's certainly not you. There have there have been a number of things that God has done in my life that He hasn't blessed me with the revelation that He gave Paul, but He's blessed me with an understanding of things that would cause me to kind of think more highly of myself than I. You know, when Satan's, when God sends Satan's messenger to me, that's what he did to Paul. It was Satan's messenger. Well, what, why does God use the word messenger? Because it's a message. It, Satan was telling Paul something, just like he was Job. And we know that what Satan was telling Job and telling Paul was wrong. It wasn't true. All right? And that's kind of where I'm going to leave it. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Join us on Sunday as we study, continue our study through Galatians. Thank you all for all your prayers concerning me and Sue in the direction of this ministry. Sue is on the mend. Uh, Nothing bad to report. Everything seems to be going in the right direction there. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.